So first of all, engaged, I believe, is like a modern day concept. It's not something we see in the Bible or what we would think of engaged and fiancés in today's day. I don't believe it's something that God uh, would have us do. Um, I don't even think it's, it's something, yeah, it's not, not something in the Bible at all. It's just something, it's not necessarily wrong. It's just something, it's a concept that is man-made. It's not something that's um, in the Bible. So a couple of points I've got here about uh, being engaged in the modern day man-made concept type of way is it's a covenant between two singles uh, to one day be married. Now, the father of the bride can still veto this covenant, right? Because a woman cannot make any covenant without her father's permission. Um, but if her father allows that covenant to pass, then I think it would be wrong for the father to then not allow her to get married. Because if he's allowed his daughter to make a covenant to promise another man that one day they will get married, if he then later on says, oh, actually, no, I'm not going to let you get married, he would actually be in the wrong because now he's causing her to sin because that covenant actually went to pass because he allowed it to begin with. So it's still a sin to break this promise, but in, in the modern day concept type of engagement, it's not adultery because you're not married. You're just two singles that have made a promise to each other. No different to two friends that have made a promise to each other to do, to do something, right? So if you break that promise, it's still a sin. It's just that if you break that promise and marry somebody else, you're not committing adultery because there is no obligation there. Um, well, there is an obligation to get married, but it's not considered marriage. And the other thing is with the modern day concept, man-made concept of engagement is any intimacy between these two singles is considered fornication. So it would be wrong because you're still single. Uh, you're not married. You've just made a promise to each other to one day get married. Now, how is that different to betrothal and espouse? And I think, in my opinion, to be betrothed and to be espoused is really two ways of saying the same thing. Um, I, I think the Bible uses these terms sort of interchangeably to talk about the same situation between uh, two, a, a, a man and a wife. But basically, from what I can tell in the Bible, uh, to be betrothed or espoused is a covenant uh, between a man and a wife, but they are considered husband and wife. So they are technically married uh, in, in a covenant aspect, but they have not yet come together physically. And I think we can see that in a couple of verses here. So it's a covenant where the couple is considered husband and wife, but have not yet come together physically. And I've just first gone here to Deuteronomy 20, verse 7. It says here, And what man is there that hath betrothed a wife? So you can see there that it's a wife and is betrothed to her. Um, and it says, And hath not taken her, let him go and return unto his house, lest he die in the battle and another man take her. So this was the instruction given before the war, saying, you know, if you come out to fight, there are certain things that say, hey, if you haven't done these things, you know, don't, don't risk your life. Go back and complete them. And, and one of them was this, is that if you had betrothed a wife and hath not taken her, let him go and return unto his house, lest he die in the battle and another man take her. So you can see there that he's betrothed to this woman, but he hasn't yet come together. And I'll show you a couple of other verses that would support this too. Another one here is Deuteronomy 28, uh, verse 30. Thou shalt, this is a judgment that God is saying uh, when it comes to the blessing and cursings in the Old Covenant. He's saying here, Thou shalt betroth the wife, and another man shall lie with her. Thou shalt build an house, and thou, and thou shalt not dwell therein. Thou shalt plant a vineyard, and shalt not gather the grapes thereof. So we see here that you know, you've betrothed the wife, you're engaged to her in the biblical sense, because this is the, the real type of engagement. The biblical engagement is betrothal or espousal. He says, you're going to engage a woman to be your wife, but you're not going to be able to lie with her. 1 Samuel 18. Now, the espousal and betrothal happens at the time when the dowry is paid. And I just want to share with you this uh, quite odd story. This is one of those stories in the Bible that sort of makes you cringe. But we need, to, we need to realize when we read this, this is not something that God asked them to do. This is just something that Saul, I guess in his sick mind, uh, asked David to do. It says here in 1 Samuel 18, uh, verse 25, And Saul said, thus shall, thou, thus shall ye say to David, The king desireth not any dowry, but an hundred foreskins of the Philistines to be avenged of the king's enemies. But Saul thought to make David fall by the hand of the Philistines. And when his servants told David these words, it pleased David well to be the king's son-in-law. And the days were not expired. Wherefore David arose and went, he and his men, and slew of the Philistines 200 men. And David brought their foreskins, and they gave them in full tale to the king, that he might be the king's son-in-law. And Saul gave him Michael, his daughter, to wife. So this is one of these stories you just kind of think, what, what a weird request of Saul to ask. Because 
It makes me think, like, who went and collected all these foreskins? How did they store the foreskins? And then who went and counted them later? Because it says here, he gave them in full tail to the king. So somebody obviously counted them to make sure that there were, you know, 200 foreskins there. Um, that's kind of gross, but, you know, th this just shows the depravity of men. But the point I, I wanted to show you that, because see, instead of a dowry, Saul asked for 100 foreskins of the Philistines. And I wanted to sh uh, just compare that to 2 Samuel 3 verse 14, where David says later on, he says, And David sent message, messages to Ishbosheth, Saul's son, saying, Deliver me my wife Michael. Because this is the reason why he went and um, got those foreskins and went, got this dowry because he wanted to marry Saul's daughter, Michael. <coughs> says, Deliver me my wife Michael, which I, look, I espoused to me for a hundred foreskins of the Philistines. You see that that espousal there is the betrothal, the engagement, but he has not yet taken her, right? That's why he's saying, deliver me my wife that I've espoused to me for a hundred foreskins of the Philistines. Uh, let's go to Matthew 1. The other situation we'll see is between Mary, the mother of Jesus, and uh, Joseph. And we'll read here from Matthew 1. Now the birth of Jesus Christ was on this wise, when as his mother Mary was espoused to Joseph, before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Ghost. So there you see, they were espoused and they had not yet come together. Then Joseph, her husband, being a just man and not willing to make her a public example, was minded to put her away privily. But while he thought on these things, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a dream, saying, Joseph, thou son of David, fear not to take unto thee Mary thy wife. So you can see that they're, they're, they're espoused, they haven't come together, but Mary is considered his wife. For that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost. And she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. Now all this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken of the Lord by the prophet, saying, Behold, a virgin shall be with child, and shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us. This is a good verse to show the, the deity of Christ. Then Joseph, uh, being raised from sleep, did as the angel of the Lord had bidden him, and took unto him his wife, and knew her not till she had brought forth her firstborn son, and he called his name Jesus. So you can see there that I believe it's saying he, he then went and, and did as the angel had, had said to him. He took his wife, but then he didn't, I guess, take her. We, we're told in verse 25, he didn't physically take her until after she had brought forth her firstborn son, which was the Lord Jesus Christ. And, you know, this also shows that the doctrine in Catholicism of uh, Mary being a perpetual virgin is false. Because it says here that he knew her not till she had brought forth her firstborn son, saying that he did know her after she had brought forth her firstborn son. He had took her and married her. Um, I'll just uh, turn quickly as well to Luke 2.5. Luke 2.5 says here, he says it to be, they're, they're now moving back to, I believe it's, uh, I can't remember where they went, but to, to be taxed. Um, he's going back to his home, home, home city, uh, Joseph. He says, to be taxed with Mary, his espoused wife, being great with child. So I think the Bible makes it a point there in Luke because we're not given that story of, you know, the angel coming to Joseph and, you know, him finding her with child and all that. So the Bible, I believe, is making a point there to say that Mary is his espoused wife as opposed to just wife because then it could, she could be married, she may not be a, a virgin, where it's saying here that she's still a virgin, they are, married, they are espoused, but they have not yet come together. Matthew 5, 31. Now, with espousal and betrothal, it's not the same as engagement, because remember we said that if you break an engagement, you're sinning. Um, but you're not committing adultery. Whereas the, with betrothal and espousal, if you break that covenant, you are committing adultery. So there's a big difference there. Um, so the covenant of espousal and betrothal can only be broken in a lawful divorce. Um, and it says here in Matthew 5.31, Jesus says here, It hath been said, Whosoever shall put away his wife, let him give her a writing of divorcement, but I say unto you that whosoever shall put away his wife, saving for the cause of fornication, causeth her to commit adultery, and whosoever shall marry her that is, uh, that is divorced committeth adultery. So you can read more. I won't go into this in this sermon. I'll preach about this another time. 
But if you go to Deuteronomy 24, you can read about that example. And we see another example of it with the example of Mary and Joseph. But the point I just wanted to make is that with espousal and betrothal, it's different to engagement because if you break that covenant and you go and marry somebody else, you are actually committing adultery if that covenant is not broken lawfully, which is saving for the cause of fornication. Now let's go to Deuteronomy 22. I just wanted to show you here that God does actually treat espousal and betrothal with the same seriousness. Um, I'll just read here in Deuteronomy 22. If a man be found lying with a woman married to an husband, then they shall both of them die, both the man that lay with the woman and the woman, so shalt thou put away evil from Israel. If a damsel that is a virgin be betrothed unto a husband, and a man find her in the city and lie with her. Then ye shall bring them both out, of the, out unto the gate of that city, and ye shall stone them with stones that they die. The damsel, because she cried not, being in the city, and the man, because he had humbled his neighbor's wife, so thou shalt put away evil from among you. So again, the consistency in verse 24, we see here that a woman that is, a, that is betrothed to a man is the man's wife. Because he's saying there, you lie with a woman that's betrothed, You've humbled your neighbor's wife. And you can see there that the penalty for sleeping with a married woman is the same penalty with sleeping with a betrothed woman because she's technically, like, they're, they're together in a sense, they're husband and wife. It's still sleeping with a man's wife and God treats it with the same severity. Now, you might ask the question, well, if, you, if it's the death sentence for adultery, and, um, and or sleeping with a married woman or sleeping with a betrothed woman, then why is there a bill of divorcement, right? Because then how can it, because then why, if, if, she's, if the husband has found some uncleanness in her, isn't that the death sentence, right? Why, why is there a bill of divorcement? You ever wondered that? Well, the reason is, I'll just show you here, um, Deuteronomy 19. There's an important principle when it comes to the death sentence we see here in Deuteronomy 19 says, one witness shall not rise up against a man for any iniquity or for any sin, in any sin that he sinneth, at the mouth of two witnesses or at the mouth of three witnesses shall the matter be established. If a false witness rise up against any man to testify against him that which is wrong, then both the men between whom the controversy is shall stand before the Lord, before the priests and the judges which shall be in those days. And the judges shall make diligent inquisition and behold, if the witness be a false witness and hath testified falsely against his brother, then, ye, then shall ye do unto him as he hath thought to have done unto his brother. So shalt thou put the evil away from among you. And those which remain shall hear and fear and shall henceforth commit no more any such evil among you. And thine eye shall not pity, but life shall go for life, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, hand for hand, foot for foot. Now I'm not preaching about the death sentence today, but I just wanted to show you here that's why um, it's not an automatic death sentence if somebody's found with uncleanness or found with child because you need two or three witnesses, people that actually catch them in the act, to sentence people to death. It can't just be hearsay, right? That's why it's the mouth of two or three witnesses, people that are actually seen. And the seriousness of it here is because people will say, well, what if two or three people just get together and then just testify against somebody and they're found guilty? Well, the risk there is is that if you try and get somebody killed and the judges make diligent inquisition and find you to be a liar, you're going to get killed. Because whatever you wanted done to that person and you're a false witness, that's what's going to get done to you. And the Bible says here, don't even pity them. You know, when they say, oh, I'm sorry, I made it up, I, you know, I repent, I lied. He says, don't even pity them. Because we want to stamp out this sort of activity in society, people falsely accusing each other and falsely witnessing against each other. So it puts that in perspective that people cannot just bring somebody to the judge and just get people put to death because they're risking their own life. And it also puts Jesus' trial in perspective because the people that were falsely witnessing against Jesus, what should have happened to them? They should have been put to death, right? When they were found, because remember their witnesses didn't line up one against another. At that point, they should have been guilty uh, and, and, and put to death. Uh, so that's why, um, you know, when a woman is found with uncleanness, or adultery happens, there are these other laws to deal with it in the Bible, and not necessarily always the death sentence, because you need those two or three witnesses. Because, you know, the husband could be lying. Because it could be the husband, right? It could be the husband that, that made her have the child, and then now he just doesn't want it, and he, he's accusing her of adultery. So uh, that's why um, 
that's in place. So that is the difference, I believe, with betro betrothal and espousal versus what we would in a modern day concept and a man-made concept of engagement. And to be honest, it's probably a much better practice because I, I don't know why. I mean, I'm still looking into why maybe Joseph and Mary uh, delayed it so long where they were in a situation where they were espoused and they had not yet come together. It might be that very shortly after, and this is just a thought I'm having and I, I might preach on this at Christmas time, but just the thought I had was, you know, it might have been very shortly after um, they had been betrothed and espoused that the angel came to Mary and she was told she was, she, she was going to conceive. Because after the angel came, if you know the story, and, um, and told her that she was going to, going, to, going to conceive the Lord Jesus Christ, she then went to visit Elizabeth, who was six months pregnant with John the Baptist, and she stayed with Elizabeth until Elizabeth gave birth to John the Baptist for three months. So it could be, this is what I think, you know, the, the angel came, told her about you know, being conceived. They had just shortly been betrothed, so that's why they hadn't come together yet. Then she went to Elizabeth's house for three months, Right to help her with that, and then when she came back to Joseph, she was found with child of the Holy Ghost, and that's and then then the angel came to Joseph and told him all that, and then he decided, you know, like the angel had said, you know, not to know her until after she had given birth to the Lord Jesus. So maybe it was only a bit more than nine months that they had not come together, but there were specific reasons why they did it. Whereas, you know, like we talked about last week, there really is no good reason to delay that. But if you do for whatever reason, you know, let's say you need to organize a wedding, you know, maybe they need to organize a marriage supper and get, get the party together and get the servants together. And, you know, maybe they want to invite people, you know, maybe they're betrothed, but, you know, they want to invite their friends. And it's not just like getting on a plane and flying to Jerusalem or flying to Nazareth. It's like they have to, you know, get their camels ready and come across for the party. So, you know, there's all these things that, that these factors that might come into play of why this delay has happened. And maybe you guys can think of others. I'm just thinking of these on the spot. But my point is, maybe that's a better way to practice uh, dating and husband and wife rather than two singles being engaged, but rather the covenant being realized that, hey, you are now husband and wife and we're just delaying the ceremony of when you come together and be married because then the temptation is gone, right? Meaning if, if you cannot contain yourself until that day, you're not fornicating anymore because you're husband and wife. You could you know, do whatever you want technically, but you might just want to make that day special, you know, and, and wait till that day where you have the ceremony and come together and, um, you know, that, that be that date. So I, I do think it's a better practice, um, but, you know, whether that's going to change, you know, maybe, maybe with us it can change. With our children, you know, we can start betrothing people and espousing people rather than singles just getting engaged and getting into all this trouble and fornicating and, and, and not walking right with the Lord. So the last situation, obviously, is married. You know, what's the difference? Well, it's basically, like, if I haven't got it already, it's a spousal and betrothal, but the people have come together. And, and really, that's why I think it's called marriage, because, you know, when you marry things together, you're joining them together. And that's why the two becoming one flesh is referred to in the Bible as marriage, because that is the two people coming together as opposed to just the covenant and the promise of betrothal and espousal. <sighs> Last point on this uh, very long offshoot, Judges 19. I just want to address the topic of uh, what is a concubine. Now, I'm not 100% sure what a concubine is, but somebody gave us a thought last week, I can't remember who it was, um, that said, you know, is it, is it like a servant uh, person, like a servant girl that is not free, uh, who is married to her master, as opposed to a wife who is a free woman who is married to her husband? So maybe that's why, you know, the Bible does mention concubines and mention wives. Um, that, you know, that, that, that makes sense to me, you know, uh, that a concubine is just a, a, a not a free woman who is married to, a, to a, a man. But it's, see, I don't believe that a concubine is just a, what, what a, lot, a lot of people would say, a live-in girlfriend, like somebody who's just a girlfriend, you're both single, but you're just fornicating and you're living together. I don't think that's what a concubine is. That's just two singles fornicating. Whereas a, a, a concubine in the Bible is referred to as somebody's wife or the, the man of a concubine, we see here in Judges 19, is referred to as the concubine's husband. And that's just what I wanted to show you here. It says here in Judges 19, And it came to pass in those days where there was no king in Israel, that there was a certain Levite sojourning on the side of Mount Ephraim who took to him a concubine out of Bethlehem, Judah. And his concubine played the whore against him and went away from him unto her father's house to Bethlehem, Judah, 
and was there four whole months. Now look here in verse 3. And her husband arose. So these are not just boyfriend and girlfriend, they're two singles. It's, the man is referred to this concubine's uh, to, to this concubine as her husband, right? And it's emphasized in this as well. He says, And went after her to speak friendly unto her and to bring her again, having his servant with him and a couple of asses. And she brought him unto her father's house. And when the father of the damsel saw him, he rejoiced to meet him. And his father-in-law, so the, even the father is, is referred to that man's concubine as a father-in-law. The damsel's father retained him and he abode with him three days, so they did eat and drink and lodge there. And it came to pass on the fourth day when they arose in the morning that he rose up to depart. And the damsel's father said unto his son-in-law, Comfort thine heart with a morsel of bread, and afterward go your way. Now this can't be just a case of them referring to each other as husband and wife, because this is actually the narrator of the story, which, is, which we believe is the Holy Ghost, referring to this man as this concubine's husband. So if that's the case then I don't believe it's just a case of them being a live-in girlfriend. It, it is actually husband and wife, but for some reason the status of a concubine is different to that of a wife, otherwise they would just be referred to as the same thing. 